Hey everyone and welcome back. You know how sometimes you make a decision and you can't quite put your finger on why you made that choice? Absolutely, like you were running on autopilot. Exactly. Well, get ready, because today we are diving deep into the fascinating world of how our brains really make decisions. Should be interesting. It all started with this YouTube video you sent us. Oh yeah, the one from the channel Bakelum, right? Five scientific techniques that will transform your mind. That's the one. It seems like you're really interested in understanding those aha moments, maybe even outsmarting your own brain a little when it comes to making choices. Always good to try to be one step ahead. Right. It and lucky for us, we've got our amazing expert speaker here who eats, breathes, and sleeps this kind of stuff. Well, I wouldn't say sleeps, but I do find this stuff fascinating. This video really digs into behavioral science, which is right up my alley. I'm excited to break it down with you. Awesome. So the video jumps right into this idea of thinking fast and slow, which immediately made me think about those times you have to make a split second decision versus those times when you really carefully weigh your options. It's a great analogy and you're spot on. The video is drawing on the work of Daniel Kahneman, who actually won a Nobel Prize for his research on this. He called these two modes of thinking system one and system two. And system one is that rapid fire instinctual one, right? Exactly. Think of it like your brain's autopilot. It's that fight or flight response. Like if you're about to step into the street and a car horn suddenly blares. Oh, oh man, I hate when that happens. <laughs> but yeah, you don't even think you just jump back. Exactly. The video actually uses the example of jumping at a loud noise pure system one. It's fast, automatic, effortless, but, and this is important, because it relies purely on instinct, it can also lead us to make errors. That makes sense. So what about those situations where we have a little more time to think things through? Is that where system two comes in? You got it. System two is the slow thinking part of your brain. Like when you're trying to solve a tricky puzzle or figure out the best route to take when traffic is really bad, it's more deliberate, more analytical. So it's less about instinct and more about logic and reasoning. Right. But here's the thing. System two, while more accurate, it takes more effort. It requires focus. And honestly, our brains are kind of lazy. Ugh. Tell me about it. My brain is always looking for the easiest route, even if it's not always the best one. Exactly. And that is why we often default to system one. It's our brain's way of conserving energy. Interesting. So our brains are all about efficiency, even if it means being a little wrong sometimes. Speaking of which, the video brings up this stick and ball problem, which I think perfectly illustrates this whole system one thinking thing. Oh, yeah. Classic example. You want to give our listeners a try. Sure. All right, everyone, get your thinking caps on. Here it is. A bat and a ball cost $1.10 together. The bat costs a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? What do you think, listeners? Don't think too hard. What's your gut telling you? What immediately comes to mind? I'll give you a minute. All right, time's up. What did you come up with? Most people would probably say... 10 cents. <laughs> right. It seems so obvious, doesn't it? It does, but... But if you do the math, that doesn't actually add up. Nope, it doesn't. And that's the beauty of system one. It jumps at that quick, seemingly obvious answer, which, you know, for a lot of things in life, those snap judgments, they serve us really well. Totally. Imagine if we had to think through every tiny little decision we made throughout the day. Exactly. We'd never get anything done. But it, in those situations, those more complex decisions, that things can get a little tricky. Yes. Especially because, remember, our brains are naturally inclined to take the path of least resistance, that law of least effort, which, let's be honest, is really just a fancy way of saying they prefer to be lazy. So basically, our brains are all about that Netflix and chill life rather than the let's hit the gym and then chill. You got it. Okay, so that's system one and system two. But this video doesn't stop there, right? It then introduces this whole concept of priming which I'll admit sounds a little creepy, like someone's messing with my brain without my permission. It's not as creepy as it sounds. Well, maybe a little. But the point is, it's really subtle. Remember that super soap example the video mentions? Remind me. So if you hear the word eat beforehand, mm -hmm. you're much more likely to complete SOP as SOP. Ah, right, right. And if you hear wash or clean first, you'd probably think SOP. Exactly. It demonstrates how our brains are constantly making associations without us even realizing it. And then those associations can end up influencing our thoughts and actions in ways that we're totally unaware of. Wow. So it's like our brains are filling in the blanks, like those autocomplete features on our phones. A perfect analogy. Our brains are bombarded with information all day long. 
To cope, they create shortcuts using past experiences and associations to make quick sense of the world around us. Makes sense. But as we're learning, those shortcuts can have some pretty unexpected outcomes. The video mentions a study where people were primed with words that are typically associated with old age, words like Florida and wrinkles. Okay. And get this, just from hearing those words, they actually started walking slower. Wait, for real? <laughs> That's crazy. So just hearing a few words about like retirement and shuffleboard yeah. made them channel their inner grandpa. It's wild, right? It really highlights how powerful our subconscious mind can be. It's like their brains were subtly influenced to embody the stereotype without even realizing it. Wow. That's kind of scary when you think about it. All the subtle influences shaping our thoughts and actions. It really makes you stop and think, doesn't it? It does. And this whole priming thing, it actually ties into this broader concept of framing, right? which the video touches on. Absolutely, it's all connected. So it's not just about the information we take in, but it's how that information is presented to us. Exactly, it's about how that information is framed that really shapes our perceptions and ultimately our choices. Okay, I think I need an example because yep. my brain is still stuck on those slow walking senior citizens. Okay, so imagine this. You're at the grocery store and you see two signs for the same ground beef. One sign says 80% lean and the other says 20% fat. Okay, I'm picturing it. Which one are you more likely to grab? The 80% lean one, for sure. Even though, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's the same thing, right? You're absolutely right, it's the exact same thing. But the way it's framed by focusing on the positive attribute, it makes it seem healthier, more appealing. Even if it isn't really healthier. Exactly, and that's the power of framing. The video mentions this fascinating research by Kathleen Bowes, who found that even just thinking about money. Yeah, thinking about money. Yeah, it made people more individualistic and, get this, less helpful. Seriously. So money really does change everything, huh? It seems that way. I guess that old saying, money makes the world go round, yeah. might be more true than we realize. But this whole priming and framing thing has me thinking, what other unconscious influences are shaping my decisions every single day? kind of creepy when you really think about it. That's the first step to taking back control. By becoming aware of these subtle influences, we can start to question our assumptions. And then hopefully make more conscious, deliberate choices. Exactly. So instead of just going with our gut every time. Which, let's be honest, our gut can be easily swayed. Totally. Instead, we can pause and ask ourselves, is this really what I want or is my brain just on autopilot right now? Okay, I like that. Awareness is key. Yeah. But how do we actually apply that to, like, real-life decisions? I can't exactly carry around flashcards with different framings yeah. to test out every time I order a coffee. You don't need flashcards. But you do need to understand your mental shortcuts, what we yeah. call heuristics. Heuristics. Yeah. They're basically mental shortcuts our brains use to simplify a complex world. And honestly, a lot of times they're helpful. They keep us from getting totally overwhelmed. Yeah. But at the same time, these shortcuts, these heuristics, they can also lead us to make predictable errors in our thinking. Okay, so how do we know when to trust our shortcuts and when to like pump the brakes and think things through a bit more? Well, that's where understanding a few key heuristics can really come in handy. For example, the video talks about the halo effect. The halo effect. I feel like I should know this one. It's basically our tendency to generalize from one positive trait to a person's entire character. Okay, I think I get it. Like, we meet someone new, and they're really attractive. And we automatically assume they must also be smart, kind, funny. Right. Even though, in reality, those things might not be true at all. Exactly. We're drawn to coherence. Our brains, like, when things make sense. So instead of acknowledging that someone can be attractive, Andy may be not so nice. We just fill in the blanks. We make those assumptions. Wow. Okay, what's another one of these sneaky heuristics we should be aware of? Well, we already touched on it earlier, but the availability bias is a big one. Availability bias. Remind me again. It's our tendency to overestimate the likelihood of events that are easily recalled. So events that are vivid, dramatic, things that really stick in our memory. Okay, so things we've actually experienced or maybe seen on the news. Exactly. So, for example, you're way more likely to be injured by a falling coconut. Wait, really? Than to be bitten by a shark. <laughs> I guess that's true. But because shark attacks are so vivid and sensationalized by the media... We think they're more common than they actually are. Exactly. We overestimate the risk. The video also talks about how people often fear dying in a plane crash 
more than from a heart attack, even though statistically you are far more likely to have a heart attack. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, plane crashes are terrifying, but again, they're also very rare. Right. So it's not that our fears are completely irrational. It's just that our perceptions are skewed because our brains are drawn to those more sensational, more memorable events. And that's why it's so important to be aware of this bias so we can make more rational decisions based on facts and statistics and not just on how easily we can recall something happening. Okay, so we've got the halo effect and the availability bias. Any other mental traps we need to look out for? I feel like this video is just exposing all of our brain's flaws. Oh, there's definitely one more we should talk about. Remember that base rate fallacy the video mentioned? That one always trips people up. The base rate fallacy. Okay, I'm not gonna lie, that one sounds a little intimidating. Like, I might need a math tutor just to understand the name. It's not as complicated as it sounds, I promise. Basically, it's our tendency to like zoom in on specific cases or really memorable events. Okay. And we totally forget about the bigger picture, the underlying probabilities of something happening. Okay, I think I need a real world example to wrap my brain around this one. Give me a for instance. All right. Imagine this. You see a news story about someone winning the lottery, right? Big headline. Maybe even their picture holding that giant check. Oh, yeah. Everyone's dream. Right. So you see that and you're like, man, someone actually won. Maybe I should buy a ticket, too. I mean, it makes you feel like you've got a chance. Exactly. But here's the thing. You get so caught up in that one person's lucky break that you completely forget about the base rate. The base rate being... The fact that the odds of winning the lottery are still astronomically small, even if someone else just won. Ah, uh, so it's like that saying, you're more likely to be struck by lightning then. Exactly. It's about focusing on the outlier, that one lucky person, and totally ignoring the statistical reality. So our brains are basically terrible statisticians. We're easily swayed by a good story. Which I guess explains a lot about the world, doesn't it? Eh. But on a more serious note, are there any other instances where this whole base rate fallacy thing really comes into play? Oh, definitely. Think about health news. You see a headline about a rare side effect from a new medication. It's all over the news. Suddenly, everyone you talk to is worried about it. Been there. Right. And even though the actual risk of experiencing that side effect might be incredibly small, it's availability, that vivid memory, makes it seem so much scarier, so much more likely to happen. So we overestimate the risk because our brains latch on to that one scary story, even if it's statistically very unlikely to happen to us. Exactly. And that's the base rate fallacy in action. We focus on the outlier, that one vivid anecdote, and ignore the bigger picture, the statistical probabilities. Wow. This whole deep dive has been quite the eye-opener. We've gone from our brains being on autopilot to all sorts of mental shortcuts and biases. And don't forget terrible statisticians. Oh, right. How could I forget that one? It's enough to make you want to just, like, crawl into a hole and let someone else make all your decisions for you. I hear you. But I think the big takeaway here is not to get discouraged. It's all about awareness. So it's not about eliminating these biases altogether. Because realistically, we can't control how our brains are wired, right? Right. It's more about recognizing those biases, understanding how they might be influencing us, and then we can make more conscious, deliberate choices. It's like shining a light on those mental blind spots so we can at least try to navigate around them. Exactly. Well, big thanks to you, expert speaker, for walking us through this fascinating and honestly a little bit terrifying world of how our brains really make decisions. It's been enlightening, to say the least. Anytime. This is the kind of stuff I love to nerd out on, so thanks for letting me geek out with you today. And to our amazing listeners, we hope this deep dive has given you a lot to think about. And maybe next time you're about to make a decision, you'll stop and ask yourself, is this really what I want? Or is my brain just trying to trick me? Until next time, everyone, keep those brains engaged, and we'll catch you on the next deep dive.